I will be giving you information on a need to know basis. Today, I am training you along with a couple of other rookies who say they want to learn this business. It takes a lot of guts and attention to small detail. Let's see if you have what it takes. I'll be teaching you about trace evidence today and what it means to rookies like you. So pay attention. Don't contaminate the evidence. And by all means, my time is valuable. So don't waste it. I will be testing you to see if you've learned anything. Those of you who have learned will earn a rookie badge. Those of you who have not will stay behind with me until you get it. I really don't like people, so trust me, you don't want to stay. I've talked enough. Let's go. Today you'll learn about the principles of exchange and what it means to the world of forensic science. They will, you will learn myths regarding CSI, trace evidence, as well as how to find and discover your own trace evidence. The objective of this is that you will be able to define principles of exchange, break TV myths, learn how trace evidence is really discovered, and then I will take you on a journey to discover trace evidence on your own. First, let's talk about the principle of exchange. Whenever two individuals come into contact with one another, a physical transfer occurs. Hair, skin, cells, wear fiber, pollen, glass fragments, non-living particles, or organic material from a person's wear. Don't touch me. Makeup or any range of various forms of material can be transferred from one person to another. Stop right here. It's time for detailed research activity. I need you to go to Google and find out what Locart's principle means. You will need to find the site that will help you answer the questions on your handout. At this point, a mentor will arrive. She'll give you a piece of paper. You'll write down the answers and then you'll come back to me and we'll discuss and see if they match mine. Locart's Principles Question 1. Edmund Locart was the director of the very first forensic laboratory in existence. The laboratory was located in Lyon, France. His exchange principle stated that with every contact leaves a trace. Trace evidence is any type of material left at or taken from a crime scene or the result of contact between two surfaces. Hey rookies, don't touch me. How fabulous they spin. Let's read a little bit about Dr. Edmund Locar. It's important that we know where this information came from and where this principle became about. Locart's exchange principle is a concept that was developed by Dr. Edmund Locart, 1877 through 1966. Locart speculated that every time you make contact with another person, place, or thing, it results in an exchange of physical material. He believed that no matter where a crime goes or what a criminal does, by coming into contact with things, a criminal can leave all sorts of evidence, including DNA, fingerprints, footprints, hair, skin, cells, blood, body fluid, uh, pieces of clothes, fibers, and more. At the same time, they will also take something away from the scene with them as well. Any action of an individual, and obviously the violent action, constitutes a crime, cannot occur without leaving a trace. Traces of physical material, no matter how, min how minutes, can tell a story. Trace evidence is factual. Unlike humans, it cannot be confused by the excitement of the moment, and it does not forget. It's a silent witness that speaks when humans cannot. Physical evidence cannot be wrong. It cannot lie. It cannot be wholly absent. Only human failure to find it. Study and understand it. 
can diminish its value. When a crime has occurred, the goal of a crime scene investigator is to recognize documents and collect evidence from both the scene of a crime and anything or anyone that may have come in contact with the crime scene. Solving the crime is then dependent upon the investigator's ability to piece together the evidence to form a picture of what happened. And that, rookies, is what you're going to be doing today. But we need to know what the myths are behind the evidence. Examples of trace evidence. To a forensic examiner, these transferred materials represent what's known as trace evidence. Some common samples of trace evidence include your little cute pet hair on your garment or rug, your hair on your brush, the fingerprints on that glass, soil half tracked into your house on your shoes, a drop of blood on a t-shirt, a used tissue paper, paint chips, and broken glass. All of this would unfold trace evidence for us. So rookies, I keep telling you to pay close attention to detail. My little blue friend here, Edward, is looking at this board. He has all the clues. He sees everything that he needs, but he doesn't understand quite how to put it together. Let's see if we could help him out. It looks like my favorite word is there. Pay attention. Watch the video. Take notes. Watch the video of the effects of CSI to dismiss or dispel the myths. Let's watch the video. So CSI didn't just launch a franchise, it created a false impression when it comes to solving crimes. CNN senior legal analyst Jeffrey Tubin writes about it in a recent edition of the New Yorker magazine. Jeffrey was given incredible access inside the New York Police Department's forensic crime lab. He found out what CSI is all about and how much of the TV show is a myth. The search for the microscopic case break. Enhancing the prints. Mountains of evidence combed for what really matters. A rare look inside a forensic crime lab. Look familiar? Well, sort of. The labs on CSI have, are always very dark with kind of a cool blue light. Yeah, it's not that way here, right? No, it's actually the opposite. You want as much light as possible because you're looking for evidence that is hard to find. But it's not as cool. It is definitely not as cool. Lisa Faber is the top criminalist in the New York City Police Department's hair and fiber unit. Over 10 years, her meticulous work has helped solve some of the city's worst crimes. Do you have a favorite case involving hair evidence? Yes, um, it was a kidnapping homicide where a 99 cent store owner was kidnapped in Queens and his body was found dumped in Bayonne, New Jersey. And detectives ultimately found the car of a suspect and they asked me to look for the victim's hairs in this car. So after pouring through hundreds and hundreds of hairs, I found three and so there was a conviction and he was sentenced to life. We also found a strand of hair. Our lab has matched it to you. But hair analysis isn't as conclusive as it is on CSI. Medulla, cuticle, and cortex are a visual match to the hairs I pulled from Pedro Aikoff's brush. We would never use the word match because that implies that they are the same. And that is not the case. We say similar to, could have come from. To a jury, the hair sample on the left may appear to have the same structure as the hair sample on the right. Indeed, a prosecutor could argue that these hairs are similar to each other. But even those words, similar to, have led to major controversy. I am not sure that juries understand what they're being told when they're being told that something is consistent with this coming from the defendant. There's no statistical basis for the microscopic uh, hair analysis. In other words, they have no idea of how many other people would have that same uh, sample of hairs. For Berger, hair evidence should be permissible in court only if it includes a DNA match, the gold standard of forensic evidence. 
The problem is visual comparisons from hair found at a crime scene and hair from a suspect have led to terrible miscarriages of justice. In a 1987 case, Jimmy Ray Bromgard was convicted of raping an eight-year-old girl. Arnold Melnikoff, the manager of the Montana State Crime Lab, testified there was a 1 in 10,000 chance that hairs found at the scene did not come from Bromgard, a bogus scientific claim. Bromgard was convicted, but 15 years later, DNA evidence showed the hairs weren't his. Back in the crime lab, Faber may already be a step ahead of the controversy. This is an example of a root that would be suitable for nuclear DNA because of the tissue that you can see around the root end. At the NYPD, hair analysis rarely stands alone anymore. It's a screening test before the big one, DNA. The days when a jury hears, this hair looks like that hair, those may be over. Yes, I mean, slowly, as they're hearing more and more DNA statistics, they're probably looking to hear those type of numbers. And as DNA is on TV more and more, um, it's something that they're looking for. So in the dim light of CSI, hair analysis may be a sure thing. But in the bright light of a real crime lab, it may be a first step, but only a first step, to the DNA lab. It's amazing. I really did not know all this stuff. Um, and even fingerprints, you're saying, are suspect. Well, um, fingerprints are less suspect. But the, the thing about DNA, it's transformed the whole debate over forensic science because it has scientific basis. You can say, you can assign a number. There's a one in so many million chance that this is not a match. I mean, right. it really is conclusive. All the other tests, whether it's hair analysis, um, uh, arson investigations, bite marks, all the stuff that you see on CSI, yes, it's a possibility that there are similarities, but you can't assign any numbers. And a lot of scientists and academics are starting to say, wait a second, if you can't put a percentage on it, it shouldn't be allowed in court. It's amazing. There's a great article, Jeffrey. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, you can read uh, more of Jeffrey's reporting in the New Yorker magazine. Up next on 360 and dinner... Okay, rookies, I hope you paid attention to the CSI effect of Anderson Cooper. This is clear evidence that certain CSI myths are just not true. Anderson Cooper removed the myths from what we believe CSI to be in real life by interviewing forensic specialists in this field. Let's see if we can remember some of the details that were given in the following categories. What you should know, rookies, is you should be able to answer the question, where did the interview take place? How much DNA do you really need? What does a real crime lab look like? On the next page, you will be asked several questions regarding Anderson Cooper's video. I hope you pay great attention to detail. Anderson Cooper 360 the CSI effect question one what crime lab did the reporter visit a Chicago B New York or C Las Vegas you see the answer clear as day rookies so don't freak out it's B New York how many hairs did the investigator use to help in getting a conviction in the kidnapping homicide case a 3 B 30 C 300 clear as day we heard her say three all right rookies almost the last question but not quite yet real crime labs tend to be darker to make it easier to see evidence true or false it's cool in CSI but it's false in the real world last question what must be present in a hair sample to test for DNA a, shaft, B, cuticle, or C, the root. She had the root under the magnifying glass, and she said that could be used for DNA. We got the red light. Let's go. Now, in this video, we're going to learn how to identify trace evidence. Pay attention. We're talking trace evidence today. The crime scene is comprised of two major elements. One, which we call the macro scene, which is everything visible, and the micro scene, which is 
everything invisible. Even fingerprints that are latent prints, I define as part of the macro scene because they're not microscopic. So anything that's microscopic, like hairs, fibers, little pieces of dust, anything like that, glass shards, are things which I consider part of the micro scene. So for every macro scene you have at the, at the, at the crime scene, there's an associated micro scene. It could be gunshot residue, it could be uh, bacteria, semen, saliva, which is typically macro scene, but it could also be micro scene because you're dealing with microscopic elements. So what we need to learn today is how do you collect these trace evidence materials. And there are three methods that are typically used in a crime scene. One we call the hunt and peck method, which is just exactly that. You've got yourself a flashlight, you've got some tweezers, you've got an envelope to put it in, and you, pick, pick, you look for them and you find them and you put them in the envelope. Typically you don't get a lot of material doing that. The next method is the taping method, where you take a piece of adhesive tape, uh, and they're specially made tapes for evidence, and you put the tape down and you lift it up, and then you protect it with some saran wrap or some other sort of material that can be removed from the tape without removing the evidence. And the third method is using a vacuum cleaner. Now you can use a regular vacuum cleaner in your house, as long as you have a filter attached to it that will trap all the materials. And the amount of material you collect goes in the progression of hunt back, taping, vacuum cleaning. Vacuum cleaning is a last resort type of thing. It's used for most situations other than looking at things on clothing or for uh, chairs and sofas. It would be used perhaps in a car where you're looking at the, at the floorboards of the car or somewhere in that, in that, in that kind of an area. How to discover and collect trace evidence. Elder Science just told us how to do that, rookies. I hope you paid attention. We're going to the next page to kind of break down what was told to us about how to identify trace evidence. Write these things down because you'll be up next at the next crime scene.
how to identify trace evidence review. Define macroscopic, large enough to perceive or examine by the unaided eye. Define microscopic, so small as to be visible only with a microscope. What are the three methods of collecting trace evidence? One, the hunt and pack method. Two, taping method. Three, the vacuum cleaner method. The hunt and pack method is using tools such as a white envelope and tweezers along with a flashlight. The taping method is using tape along with saran wrap to secure the tape. And the vacuum cleaner method is used with a vacuum cleaner. Where do you place your evidence after it has been found? Put evidence into a white envelope. Seal it with an evidence tape seal. Let's go. Now that you know how to identify evidence, it's time to gather some evidence of your own. It's time for your classroom crime. You will need to go to the classroom crime scene. Now that you have gotten rid of all the CSI myths, using Locart's principles of how to, and how to identify the evidence that is transferred, you will need to find the evidence at the crime scene by using the hunt and pack method, the taping method, and the vacuum cleaner method that will be provided to you by the mentor in which I assigned. Good luck and happy investigating. See you at the next crime job. Rookies. Today, you should have learned about how things work in the CSI department. You are now able to define principles of exchange, break TV myths, tell how trace evidence is discovered. You have discovered trace evidence on your own, and you still have only scratched the surface. There is plenty more you need to know, but great news, you earned your rookie bash today. But before you start solving bigger crimes, like who stole the school's trophy, the great thing is you now are equipped with the tools necessary to do an effective investigation. See you at the next crime scene.